an amazing God we serve. What a, what a pleasure it is to be part of his family. What a joy it is to walk with him. Last week we um, got to hear about the, the pathway of unity in the church. As, uh, as Pastor Matt gave us a message from Ephesians 4. The week before that, we were in Philippians, which is where we're returning today, chapter 3, if you want to turn there. And we learned in Philippians 3 that there is an ultimate prize. There is a, there's a calling to that prize of which none of us have arrived. We're not to look to the past. We don't rest on our past achievements and say, well, I've done the work. No, we, we, we stay steadfast until the Lord calls us. We don't look at our past failures and say he can't use me anymore because a God, our God's able to restore all things in us and use us for his purpose. But we press on. We press on to the high calling, the heavenward bound person in Christ. And he says, if you don't have that view, you know, God will make it clear to you. That, that's the view of the mature in Christ is that we are continuing to press on. Well, we're going to look in this passage today at, at that journey, the, the path to joy, um, the walk that we walk as we go, and, and much of the rest of Philippians actually gives us hints into walking that path and going down that journey. We have a path before us. We have a race to run, a course that's been set. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 1 tells us that we're surrounded by a great cloud or company of witnesses, and, and because of that, we are to throw off the the things that hinder and the sin that entangles and, and run with perseverance the race marked out for us. And how many of you have read Pilgrim's Progress? A number of you, I think, probably. I mean, that's a great book if you haven't ever read it. It's just, it, it talks about all the things that can get us distracted from that path, all of the things that we can get twisted on and, and led down that, that lead us astray. And even if we get off God's path a little bit, if we continue down that wrong path we can we can go a long ways astray we have a god who gets us back but but staying on that path is important i uh <clears throat> substituted once for a track team when i was teaching at wishram the track coach was gone and wanted his track team to have their practice so he asked me <clears throat> that's interesting i can't run i I mean, I didn't have the post polio then, but I still, like, running was not something I could do. So I sent the track team out to run the, the course that he had laid out for them, which was, if you've ever been in Wishram, Wishram's down the bottom of a cliff, you know. There's two ways in, and they both involve going down the edge of the cliff. <clears throat> so they were to run the road up to one side, across the highway on the top, and then run down the other road. So off I sent them. And after I gave them some time to be out there and probably get about half the course done, I uh, got in the car and decided I'd see how they're doing. So I drove the whole course, and there was two kids that were not on the path, um, which is a little scary. Um, given the, the path, if you took a shortcut, which is I found out from some other kids it's what they did, involved you know going up these rock cliffs. Well, if you've ever been to Wishram, you, you come down one way, and you can see the school, I remember the first time I came down that road because the school's down over this hill and then there's a cliff up beside you and there's a sign on this narrow road that says watch for falling rocks. You've seen those signs before, right? Watch for falling rock. I mean, that, is, that doesn't happen. They're just kind of there because it might happen. Well, in Wishram, it's watch for falling rock and dodge the rocks that are on the road that weren't there the day before because they fall all the time. And if you bounce off the road, you go down to the school. I thought, oh, this is great. Okay, here we go. So, so they're up there thinking, I'm going to be watching for falling kids. Um, not only that, but you've got the place where snakes like to hide out, right? They love to go out and bake on those rocks. And this is eastern Washington, so we're talking rattlesnakes. I'm thinking, what are you kids doing? So I finally drove around, and I caught them. They got back up to the road. I said, uh, you guys didn't take the right path. I'm going to make sure you do. So I get in front of my car and start running. And I said, I'm following you all the way, so you better not stop. Uh, they never asked me to be track coach again. I don't know why, but anyway. That <laughs> we can get on the wrong path, and, and, and really the desire that God has for us and that we ought to have is that we should... We should walk the path he has for us. By the way, I, I love it that as we go down that path, all of us as believers intersect, right? I mean, part of that path is individual. Part of it is a calling to all of us, like the command to love one another as Christ has loved us. 
men will know we're his disciples if we have love for one another. We get to intersect on that path and, and meet and show God's love. The, the call to unity, Jesus' prayer in John 17, what talked about has, as he and the Father were one, may we be one in him, and, and through that unity that the world may know who Jesus is. So we, we intersect in, in making that effort for unity and sharing God's love for one another. We intersect on the, on the cause of sharing the gospel. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. That's, that's, that is a charge that's for every believer in Christ. All of us do that, and we get to, we get to share in those things together. We get, we get to share in what we're doing this morning. You know, gathering together to worship God, gathering together to, to be taught of his word, to encourage one another, gathering together to commune together in the breaking of bread. Those things are happening this morning. Those are all things where we get to intersect in our paths. I love those intersections as part of the body of Christ. But he also has a path for each one of us. And, and so as we look to those, we, we, we get some hints from Paul on how to follow that path. Let me, let me pray again. Father, we just come before you grateful for your word. Lord, I pray that you would direct each one of our hearts on the path you have for us. Lord, where we've gone astray, will you show us this morning and move our hearts to come back to follow your path and to walk with you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So verse 17 is where we're starting in Philippians chapter three. And Paul says, join with others in following my example and take note of those who live according to the pattern we gave you. So the first, the first thing in, in following God's path is that there, there are people to whom we can follow. There are people that we're to join with in, in walking down this path. And, and the, as you look at, well, who is it should we follow? Who should we um, have this idea? It's, it's those who are examples those who are examples. And I'm sure you've heard many times Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. But I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. I, I, want, I just wanted you to hear a, a, a few more specifics about Paul making that call to, to be an example. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning in verse 14. Paul writes this. I'm not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. I, uh, we're going to read another verse, but I just want to, I want to stop on that one for a second. You know, Paul was a spiritual father to many in the church in Corinth because he had been there to lead them to Christ and disciple them. And, and as a spiritual father, he's appealing to them. I, you know, when we have the privilege of leading someone to know Jesus, um, we need to understand that, that that's a role that God's given us to, to be, in a sense, a, a spiritual parent to them, to to lead them and guide them, and, and I want to be able to say, I urge you to imitate me. That's, that's, a, that's quite a statement. You know, Paul could make that statement, and he goes on, he says, for this reason I'm sending you Timothy, my son whom I love, he's, a, he's another one who Paul discipled, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with what I teach everywhere in every church consistent teaching of God's truth and consistently living by that truth. That's, that's the call. There's a, there's a young man that goes to the school here and a, um, a couple years ago I had the opportunity to lead him to Christ. And he's gotten involved with our youth group and comes. Um, he doesn't attend our church here. The family goes to another church. But um, his mom's a single mom raising him, and his mom will call me from time to time, say, you know, will you please talk to my boy because he respects you. And he keeps asking me, especially recently, every week at school, Mr. Olive, are you going to come to youth group tonight, you know? And so there's a connection. Um, I, I haven't been able to do that. I'm hoping to do that soon. There's a, there's a connection because um, 
I, I've invested in his life and God's gave me that, that privilege and that joy of sharing the message to which he received. It's not a work I did any of and yet I was a part of it. And, and so I, I think about that. Am I living as an example before him? Is, does my life match? We, we saw in, in Philippians chapter two, you might remember we looked at the life of Timothy. Paul said, I don't, I don't have anyone else like him. I mean, he stands out as one who has a genuine interest in your well-being. And he said, because Timothy does not look to his own interests, but he looks to the interest of Jesus Christ. So in the passage we just read, Paul could say, I'm sending you Timothy because he's faithful in the Lord. And in the book of 1 Timothy, when Paul writes to this young disciple of his, in chapter 4 and verse 12, he says, do not let anyone look down on you because you're young, but set an example for the believers in speech, in life, in love, in faith, and in purity. And there's, there's really um, something that ought to be the goal of every one of us who calls on the name of Christ, that, that we would live what we say we believe, that our life would be consistent, not, not just what we do here at church, but our life would be consistent in, in what we do here, what we do on the job, what we do in our homes, what we do when we're out in recreation or whatever activity we're engaged in, that our hearts and minds are on serving Jesus and people can see Jesus in us. So join with others who, who follow that example. Be, be a part of that. Let, let let them be an encouragement to you. Let you be an encouragement to them as we walk together this path with Jesus, pointing people to Christ. But notice he also mentions in this verse back in Philippians 3.17, you know, the follow the pattern we gave you. And there's a pattern or an example of a lifestyle that was given because it's quite true that there are people, we even saw this in Philippians 1, who preach the gospel for wrong motives, Right? You don't necessarily want to follow their example. You can still be saved through the gospel message. I mean, a, a donkey can speak to a prophet, so God can use anybody to share truth, and they might catch hold of that, but the examples are the ones that are living their lives for Christ. Um, when Paul's talking to the church in Crete, when he writes to Titus, and he, he tells them about you know these people who claim to know God so that's, that's their claim, but by their actions, they deny him. And that, so he, he says, when you watch for these people to follow, these people to be a part of your life and your journey and your path, make sure they're not the, what, what I call the pious pretenders, the ones who say they believe in Jesus, say they want to follow Christ, but you look at their lifestyle and it doesn't match up at all. It's just not there. It's not, it's not a reality for them. Paul's encouraging us to, to watch for the pattern of lifestyle that he had set down and that the, the truth of God's word set down. They don't just talk the talk, but they walk the walk. Of that group in Titus 1.16, when he says they, their actions, they deny him, he goes on to say they're detestable, disobedient, and unfit for anything good. So, so you gotta watch the pattern. Um, you got to be look. In fact, in Second Timothy chapter three, the 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 chapter starts with mark this: there will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, abusive. It goes on with this list of 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 horrible things. And you, we look at that and we go, man, man, the world is such a an evil place. And then when you read the context of of Second Timothy three, you realize he's not talking about the world; he's talking about the church talking about those who have a form of godliness but deny its power. That's a scary thing. And by the way, we're seeing things that we would never thought creep into the church becoming a part of churches across America and not just liberal churches but even those that called themselves evangelical churches and not seeking to live to honor Christ, not setting that example. We, we want to be careful not to get caught up in them. And by the way, somebody who is seeking to follow Christ is honest about their struggles. 
You know, sometimes we get guilty of we, you know, we come to church and we put on our church face, we have our church clothes, and we have our church behavior. And I, I've been in numerous counseling sessions with people whose lives are a wreck and saying, everybody at church has it all together. And I go, what church are you talking about? Anybody here got it all together? I have a, um, a friend, um, his name's Dave Ar Arbogast, and he's, he's a guy that loves the Lord. And he, um, he was talking about the church that he attends in Tacoma, and one of the things that really um, spoke to his heart when he first went there, and he's been there for years now, but the, the, the people were willing to own their struggles. It is a small church. Sometimes that's more comfortable, but people would get up and they'd confess their sins right there in front of the body and say, will you pray for me? You know, it's like, wow. <laughs> he said, that really, that really moved and, and touched him because too often, you know, we, we pretend to be something we're not. And um, so I don't, I don't know if you, you probably, you know, well, I can't see anyway until I get my new, new eyes, hopefully, but, but I didn't see any hands go up saying they had their life all together because all of us have struggles. I was, I was counseling with a young couple. They're getting married November 7th, and, and so we were, we were talking about, you know, struggles and issues in their lives and, you know, just having those things, and I said, you know, I said, everybody struggles with sin, and, and you, in your marriage, you're going to have times when you struggle with that between each other, and you know, you, you got you to gotta be willing to own it. You got to be willing to seek forgiveness. And, and I said, I, you know, some of us can hide our struggles. Some of us can't. And I, I patted my belly. And uh, he, he knows me, and he, the young man, and he said, he said well, you, you got post-polio, and you can't exercise, and you can't do all this. And I, said, I looked at him and said, yeah, I can make excuses if I want. But I can tell you that, that I, I struggle with self-control in that area, and I have for years. God's given me victory at times, and times I've given into the flesh, but I, I said, I, I, I'm, it's not something I can do very good hiding, because I wear it. Uh, you know, if I struggled in, like, with alcohol or with drugs, this, with that same thing, I wouldn't even be up here, right? So, I, you know, you, who, who are you going to look down your nose at, right? If I have an issue of self-control in one area, Mine might be more acceptable than somebody else's. It does not make me better. I, you know, we, we need Jesus. I need Jesus every day of my life. And so as Paul goes on in our passage in Philippians, he speaks of those um, who are enemies. This is... I, I didn't put people to avoid. I put problems to avoid in your notes, in my notes, because as we look through these things that are listed here in Philippians 3, these are things we all struggle with. I mean, we, we hopefully don't give ourselves fully to them, but they're issues that might, might touch on the things that, that's, that speak to your life. You know, he says, I, as I told you before, he says, even now I say it again, even with tears, there are many who live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame and their mind is on earthly things. Wow. How would you like to be listed as an enemy of the cross? I, I want to submit to you that every day that you live without surrendering your life to Christ for that day, you are living as an enemy of the cross. Because you're pretending that you can go through this day without Jesus. You're pretending that you don't need Jesus' help. I can do this without you. I don't need to spend any time with you this morning. I don't need to surrender myself to you, Jesus. I got this one. When you do that, you're living as an enemy of the cross. You, you came to the cross because you were broken and you needed Jesus, and you need Jesus every single day. I need Jesus every single day. I mean, it, it, it has to be that way. And when, I, when I seek to live apart that way, I'm denying the very gospel truth. I, um, this morning I was listening to uh, Ravi Zachariah's program. Of course, he's gone to be with the Lord now, but he made a statement in there that says, if you're not spending time in prayer and devotion every single day, he said, you're, you're not going to make it. It's not, a, it's not a 
that's not a bad idea type thing. It's, it's a necessity. It's a necessity. You know, the man who was up here speaking for the last almost 20 years, you know, he gets up every morning and spends time with God. You know that of him, don't you? It's true of Pastor Paul. I get up every morning and I spend time with God. And I'll tell you what, I'm not going to make it through my day. I'm, I cannot live the path that he's marked out for me without him. It is impossible. And so we need him. Now, when you become an enemy, an enemy of the cross, there's kind of two ways we tend to turn. Um, one is giving way to the flesh and the other is exalting the flesh. One is, is letting, letting yourself be drawn to the things of this world. Um, I mean, going down that path. James describes it this way in chapter 4. He says, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to become a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. There, there are those uh, the Bible speaks about, um, 2 Peter chapter 2, who actually seek to entice people to the freedom we have in Christ, right? Hey, you can do all this stuff. There used to be a guy in the Seattle area here, very, very popular pre preacher. He became known as the cussing pastor because he would get up on Sunday mornings and he would purposely use swear words because he was free in Christ. I'm going, Really? That's what my freedom in Christ means? My, my freedom in Christ is I am free to be able to live as God designed me to live because of Jesus Christ. I don't have to live in the slavery to my sin nature. I'm set free. Jude describes it as, as those who use grace as a license for immorality. Yeah, you've heard this. God will forgive me anyway. I can go ahead and do it, right? All I got to do is pray and ask forgiveness. It's all good. He says, the people that live like that deny our Lord Jesus Christ. The, the other side of the coin is those who exalt. Um, turn, turn back with me to Galatians. Um, Galatians chapter 5. Uh, some people go the other way. They, they try to exalt the flesh. So they, they try to set up a, a bunch of rules and standards by which we can live and say, if you do this, you're righteous, right? Uh, they, they, we, you know, we call it legalism. That's what we refer to it as. Galatians chapter 5, when Paul talks to those who, who, who promote this idea of putting people back under the law to try to impress God, he, he's pretty harsh. Um, we'll look at verse um, 7 of Galatians 5. You were running a good race. Who cut in on you and kept you from obeying the truth? That kind of persuasion does not come from the one who calls you. A little yeast works through the whole batch of dough. In this case, he's talking about this false teaching of putting you back under the law. He says, verse 10, I'm confident in the Lord that you will take no other view. The one who is throwing you into confusion will pay the penalty, whoever he may be. Brothers, if I'm still preaching circumcision, why am I still being persecuted? In that case, the offense of the cross has been abolished. As for those agitators, I wish they'd go the whole way in a emasculate themselves Whew. you my brothers were called to be free but do not use your freedom to indulge the sinful nature rather serve one another in love that's the call that he gives us with our freedom I, I, don't, I don't want to become an enemy of the cross by adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ I am saved by the power of Jesus Christ, his shed blood on the gospel, on the cross, his shed blood on the cross for me. Jesus died to pay for all the sins of Jeff Olive. God is completely satisfied with Jesus' payment, and I put my faith and trust in the one who's been raised again. That's the basis, the only basis I have to stand before God. And it's by the power of Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit in me that I can live even one day or one moment of one day for him. I need him. And that is the truth, not as a license to do evil, 
but by the grace of God, the power of God in me, causing me to live righteously before him, walking his path. It, back to Philippians 3, you notice where these, these enemies end up. They end up um, being led by their stomach. In other words, they're following their own pleasures and desires, and they end up exalting what is shameful. Exalting what is shameful. Isaiah, when he is talking to the people of Judah, he says, woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness. Wow, we are, we are there. The end of that verse, he says, woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. That isn't a description of the time in which we live. I don't know what is. When you, when you follow the downward spiral of Romans chapter 1, where they start with not acknowledging God or giving thanks to him, and they end up with a depraved mind, they end up with their thinking is futile, it's darkened, God gives them over, and they gauge in sexual immorality, and then that becomes even more perverse, and then they become a retrograde a totally depraved mind engaging in all these things. And you get to the very last verse of Romans 1, verse 32, and it says that although they know God's righteous decrees, that those who do these things deserve death, they not only continue to do the very same things, but they also encourage those who practice them. They approve of those who are doing those things. If that's not a description of the U.S., I don't know what is. That's where we're at. That's where we've come. That, that, that's just kind of frightening to think that that's where we're at. I, and I, boy, I do believe this coming election is a crossroads. I really do. Which way are we going to turn? Are we going to turn for following the righteous path of God, or are we going to turn to give ourselves over to this depravity? Um, that is where we're at. You know, sin that's unchecked, that's where it leads. And not just as a nation, but as an individual. Deal with your sin. We're going we're gonna to celebrate communion today. And I, I think one of the purposes for that is for you and I to deal with our sin. And we, we in communion, we come to the foot of the cross and we own that it was Jesus' broken body for me. It was Jesus' blood shed for me in which I can find forgiveness and so we're called to examine ourselves before we partake and, and to make sure I'm right with God when I read through the New Testament it, it appears to me that they, they actually celebrated communion every time they met and they met every day <laughs> imagine that I think you and I even, even when we're not having a, a corporate time of communion with Jesus which is I think a wonderful wonderful experience but even on an individual basis, I need to have that communion with Jesus where I come to the foot of the cross and I own that Jesus has done it all for me and I confess my sins. The beauty is 1 John 1, 9 is true. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why would we not come to that? Because if you leave that sin unchecked, I guarantee you it'll lead to a path of depravity. That is where it heads, and I don't want to go there. The, the last thing that Paul mentions of these enemies of the cross is that they're truly earthly-minded. They're earthly-minded. Um, we're exhorted by John in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, do not love the world or anything in the world. And then he goes on to describe what that looks like, right? The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. In other words, when I'm, when I'm driven to just satisfy my own fleshly desires, when I'm, I'm driven and, and coveting the things I see and I, those are the things I want, and when I'm um, speaking boastfully about who I am and what I've done, that's how he describes the world that we're not to be a part of and it's not to be a part of us. <clears throat> I wonder sometimes how much we are influenced by that in our lives. You know, I, have you ever stopped to say, what are your goals? 
what are your desires? If, if you were to talk to somebody about, these are the things I want, this is what I'm after, this is, this is what I'm really seeking to do, how many of those things, or what part of those things is truly thinking about heaven? Or is it focused on the here and now? I have a friend who will often say, I spend too much time trying to build the kingdom of Bob instead of the kingdom of God. And I, you know, it's, it's kind of, uh, examining that, it's kind of it, it's hard. I mean, because oftentimes I'm, I realize that's where I'm at. I, I, I thought about our elections. And I thought, well, how many of us are concerned about the elections because the impact it's going to have on my life rather than thinking about the kingdom of God? We've had a lot of people who have exited Washington State and even more that have exited California because of the things going on. And I'm tired of this stuff, and I, I understand that. I do. But I was thinking about this this morning. So if, if those of us who believe and know the Lord Jesus say, man, I, this place is going to be judged, and I don't want to be there when it happens. Well, who are you leaving behind that if we leave, we'll not get a chance to hear the gospel of Jesus. I, I remember the words of Nick Saint to his child when they went before the Indians. He said, Dad, if they attack you, will you use your gun and protect yourself? The little boy crying out to his father, and his father said, I can't do that. Because if they kill me, I know where I'm going to be. But if I kill them, they've never had the chance to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus. Where, where does my road take me? Because I, I often, I think about that, and I think too often it's, it's all about trying to build my earthly comfort and earthly pleasures and things that I want rather than thinking about what God would call me to do. Eh, don't get me wrong, God loves us. I, as I was driving this morning, kind of going over this message, I, I came on, on top of a hill and I saw Mount Rainier, um, you know, silhouetted with the sun coming up this morning. It was like, oh, you know, just that glorious beauty. I, I just think of the beauty of the area we live and what a beautiful day it is today and, and how good God is to us and how wonderful he is. But I have to ask myself, what are my goals? How am I using my time and resources? Does it reflect him? Or, or maybe it's, it's considering my limitations. You know, I, I could never do that, and you can fill in the blank, because I, I have the wrong personality, or I don't have enough energy, or I'm just, whatever, you can come up with whatever you want. Now, on the one hand, I'll say, you're right, you can't do that, because anything God is calling you to do, you don't have the power to do it in yourselves. But when you look at what God is calling you to do, and you say, I can't do that, now you're questioning his ability. He can do it. God can do it. So I, I, want, my, I want my thoughts to be revamped. <laughs> I want to say, of the things that I'm looking toward, are they about his kingdom? Are they about walking down the path? Because he calls us to go to difficult places and to do hard things but he always gives us the power and strength to do it. That's the God we serve. And so Paul closes this section talking about the promises that are fulfilled in power. God's promises to us, that's, that's where, we're not part of this earthly cycle of destruction. We're part of another thing. We, we look to God and to his promises. His divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness through our knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these, he's given us, get this, his very great and precious promises. Why? So that through them, you can participate in the divine nature and escape the corruption of the world caused by evil desires. That's 2 Peter 1, 3 and 4. See, God's divine power invested in us through trusting in his promises. And 2 Corinthians 1.20 tells us that no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Jesus. <laughs> we, we can see that happen in him. And so, so what does he promise us? Well, Paul first says, our, but our citizenship, it's in heaven. We're, we're not of this world. We are going home. 
And you don't want home to be planted here. I want my home to be there. That's, that's the home I'm looking for. In 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter challenges, he says, Dear friends, as aliens and strangers in this world, aliens and strangers in this world, he says, I, I, want you to, I want you to think that way. I want you to be thinking about who you are in Christ. He, so, he says, as an alien and stranger, I want you to abstain from sinful desires. I want you to live such good lives among the pagans that when they, they might accuse you of wrong, but when they see your deeds, they're going to glorify God on the day of his visitation. I, I need to have a mindset that sees myself as one who's passing through. My, my treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue, right? I mean, I, I, I want my focus to be on going home. Because guess what? We eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. Are, are you excited about that shout? Are you excited about that call? Are you excited about that time when God is going to call me home, call us home? I am. And, it's, and I can tell you that when I'm living for Christ, I'm more excited. When I'm distracted by this world, I'm less excited. And when the children of Israel were taken into captivity into Babylon, they were told it was going to be for 70 years, which meant a number of them died while they were in Babylon. And there were those born and raised that never even knew the temple. But at the end of the 70 years, King Cyrus issues a decree, hey, you guys can go back to the land, rebuild the temple, get it started over again. I want you to get things right with God for my kingdom. Go! And you read the list of people that returned in Ezra and Nehemiah. It's about 42,000 people, a very small fraction. You know what happened? They got comfortable in Babylon. I, I think that's one of the problems with America. I think that's why we've become so impotent as a church in reaching out and doing change in the world in which we live is we've gotten comfortable in Babylon. I like it here. It's very nice. I can have my nice little world and be comfortable. It's so good. I can surround it. I, I don't know about you, but I want to get on God's path. And God's path, he deals times of blessing, times of trial, it's all directed by him, but that's the path I want to be on because you know what? God is able. Jesus, who through the power that enables him to put all things under his feet is going to transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Our God is able. Are you been, have you been struggling with a sin in your life? Are, are you going to tell me this morning that God is not able to give you victory over that? Are you concerned about a sickness? Are you concerned about a broken relationship? Are you gonna tell me that God is not able to heal and restore? I wanna tell you that the problem is not God's ability. It's my willingness. For he is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work in us. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 20. Our God is able. And this able God is going to transform our lowly bodies that they might be like his glorious body. 1 John chapter 3. How great is the love the Father has lavished on us that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Now we are children of God. And what we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. Everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he is pure. When we get our eyes and our focus on our coming Savior, when we recognize that our citizenship is not here, it's somewhere else. And we understand that he is going to transform us. He's going to come and rescue us. He's going to take us to be with him. And when we have that hope, 
It has a purifying effect on our lives as we seek to live for him. So my challenge for all of us this morning, am I on the right path? Have I been distracted by something? Have I been led astray? Have I given way to my fleshly desires? Have I tried to exalt myself as being somehow better than others? Have I thought that I could get through this day without Jesus? Because anytime you take those roads, you get off the path. May Jesus get us back on the path. May Jesus get us back on the path that says, I want to follow him, and I know that he's able to do whatever he calls me to do. I don't want to wait for the world to come to me, this dying world in which we live. I want to go. And I want to go to the places where people are hurting. I don't need to be afraid because when God calls me, he's with me. He'll never leave us. He'll never forsake us. He will walk with us in power as we walk down this path day by day. Get right with him this morning. Get right with him before we partake of the communion. He's going to provide all you need for your journey. And until he takes us home, may we walk with him. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I thank you for your promises. I thank you for the one we found in the very beginning of this book. You who began a good work in us will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Thank you for getting us back on the path. God, we want to walk down that path today. Which means, God, we need to own our sin before you. We need you, Jesus. And we need your forgiveness. Lord, whatever sin is on the hearts of anybody in this room, I just pray that they would quietly give it up to you right now. Lord, for those that know you, that are here this morning, Lord, would you give us the courage to let you have your way? Give us the courage to let go of the things of this world and our, our comforts as you would lead us. Lord, give us the courage to not be caught up in the things of this world, but to walk your path, even when that means going to places that we, we might would be afraid. But we don't have to because you're with us. Lord, would you challenge our hearts to, to do what you call us to do? To not say we can't, because it's true that none of us can in ourselves, but, but with you, God, you're able to do more than we can imagine. So we want to give ourselves to you right here and right now and say, Jesus, I surrender my life to you. I want to walk the path that you've marked out for me. God, if there's someone here who does not know you, Lord, would you speak to their hearts because they, they can't even get on the path. They're not, not even on the start of the path. They're walking the path of destruction. God, would you let them see that? Would they turn their hearts and their eyes to recognize how much you love them, enough to pursue them, enough to give your life for them, enough to shed your blood and take the penalty that they deserved and pour it out on to your son. That those who would trust in him, those who would believe in the name of Jesus would be saved. Let them call on your name. Let them believe that you are raised from the dead, that Jesus, you're alive. And may that be evident in us as a church body here, that you are alive in us. Not just here at church, but in our homes, in our workplaces, as we go shopping in everything. May our focus be on you. May we be walking your path in Jesus' name. And all God's people said,